so welcome in everyone to the part two of the Bristinger reading, my friends. Part one has already been posted. Again, if you want to join us for our live streams where we play a variety of games right now, which are Breath of the Wild on Master Mode and Kingdom Hearts, I do Breath of the Wild during the week and Kingdom Hearts in the weekend at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 Mountain Standard, 7 Central, and 8 Eastern. And on Mondays, we read books in Discord like this, which you can join at 6 p.m. Pacific, 7 Mountain Standard, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern. And I do all the voices as best I can. And now, let's return back in to the story with Aragon and Roran outside of Hellgrind, trying to rescue Katrina with Saphira. You should sleep, said Saphira to Aragon and Roran. It's late and we must rise early tomorrow. Aragon looked at the black vault of the sky, judging the hour by how far the stars had rotated. The night was older than he expected. That's sound advice, he said. I just wish we had a few more days to rest before we storm Hellgrind. The battle at the Burning Plains drained all of Saphira's strength and my own, and we have not fully recovered. What with the flying here and the energy I transferred into the belt of Beloth the Wise these past two evenings... My limbs still ache, and I have more bruises than I can count. Look! Loosening the ties on the cuff of his left shirt sleeve, he pushed back the soft lamoray, a fabric the elves made by cross-weaving wool and nettle threads, revealing a rancid yellow streak where his shield had smashed against his forearm. Ha! said Roran. You call that tiny little mark a bruise? I hurt myself wor worse when I bumped my toe this morning. Here, I'll show you a bruise you... You, you, you can be proud of. He unlaced his left boot, pulled it off, and rolled up the leg of his trousers to expose a black stripe as wide as Aragon's thumb that slanted across his quadriceps. I caught the half of a spear as a soldier was turning about. That's impressive, but I have even better. Ducking out of his tunic, Aragon yanked his shirt free of his trousers and twisted it aside so that Roran could see the large blotch in his ribs and the similar discoloration on his belly. Arrows, he explained. Then he uncovered his right forearm, revealing a bruise that matched the one in his other arm, given when he had deflected the sword with, with his bracers. Now, Roran bared a collection of regular green spots which were the size of a gold coin that marched from his left armpit down to the base of his spine, the result of having fallen upon a jumble of rocks and embossed armor. Aragon inspected the lesions and chuckled and said, <laughs> Those are pinpricks. Did you get lost and run into a rose bush? I have one that puts those to shame. He removed both his boots, then stood and dropped his trousers, so that his only garb was his shirt and woolen underpants. Top that if you can, he said, and pointed at the inside of his thighs. A righteous combination of colors modeled his skin as if Aragon were on an, or an exotic fruit that was ripening in an uneven patch, from crabapple green to putrefied purple. Oh, said Roran. What happened? I jumped off Saphira when we were fighting Murtag and Thorn in the air. That's how I wounded Thorn. Saphira managed to dive under me and catch me before I hit the ground, but I landed her back a bit harder than I wanted to. Roran winced and shivered at the same time. Does it go all the way? He trailed off and made a vague gesture upwards. Yeah, unfortunately. I have to admit that's a remarkable bruise. You should be proud. It's quite a feat to get injured in the manner you did in, in that particular place. <laughs> I'm glad you appreciate it. Well, said Roran, you may have the biggest bruise, but the Razak dealt me a wound that likes of which you cannot match, since the dragons, as I understand, removed the scar from your back. While he spoke, he divested himself of his shirt and moved farther into the pulsing light of the coals. Aragon's eyes widened before he caught himself and concealed his shock behind a more neutral expression. He berated himself for overreacting, thinking, it can't be that bad. But the longer he studied Roran... The more dismayed he became. A long, puckered scar, red and glossy, wrapped around Roran's right shoulder, starting at his collarbone and ending just past the middle of his arm. It was obvious that the Razak had severed part of the muscle and the two ends had failed to heal back together for an unsightly bulge to form the skin below the scar. 
where the underlying fibers had recoiled upon themselves. Farther up, the skin had sunk inward, forming a depression half an inch deep. Roran, you should have shown this to me days ago. I had no idea the Rosic had hurt you so badly. Do you have any difficulty moving your arm? Not the side or back, said Roran. He demonstrated. But in the front, I can only lift my hand about as high as mid-chest. Grimacing, he lowered his arm. Even that's a struggle. I have to keep my thumb level or else my arm goes dead. The best I've found is to swing my arm around from behind and let it land on whatever I'm trying to grasp. I skinned my knuckles a few times before I mastered the trick. Aragon twisted the staff between his hands. Should I? Saphira asked Aragon. No, should I? Said Aragon to Saphira. I think you must. We may regret it tomorrow. You have more cause for regret if Roran dies because he cannot wield his hammer when the occasion demanded. If you draw upon the resources around us, you can avoid tying yourself further. Do you know who I hate doing that? Even talking about it sickens me. Our lives are more important than an ant's, Saphir countered. Not to an ant. And are you an ant? Don't be glib, Aragon. It'll, it ill becomes you. With a sigh, Aragon put down the staff and beckoned to Roran. Here, I'll heal that for you. You can do that? Obviously. A momentary surge of excitement brightened Roran's face, but then he hesitated and looked troubled. Well, now? Is, is that wise? As Saphira said, Better I tend to you while I have the chance, lest your injury cost you your life or endanger the rest of us. Roran drew near, and Aragon placed his right hand over the red scar, while at the same time expanding his consciousness to encompass the trees and the plants and the animals that populated the gulch, save those he feared were too weak to survive his spell. Then Aragon began to chant in the ancient language. The incantation he recited was long and complex, repairing such a wound went far beyond growing new skin, and it was a difficult matter at best. In this... Aragon relied upon the curative formulas that he had studied in El Ismira and devoted so many weeks to memorizing. The silvery mark on Aragon's palm, the Gedway Ignazia, glowed white hot as he released the magic. A second later, he uttered an involuntary groan as he died three times, once each with the two small birds roosting in a nearby juniper, and also with a snake hidden among the rocks. Across from him, Roran threw back his head and bared his teeth in a soundless howl as his shoulder muscles jumped and writhed between the surface of his shifting skin. Then, it was over. Aragon inhaled a shuddering breath and rested his head in his hands, taking advantage of the concealment they provided to wipe away his tears. Before he examined the result of his labor, he saw Roran shrug several times, then stretch and windmill his arms. Roran's shoulder was large and round, the result of years spent digging holes for fence posts, hauling rocks, and pitching hay. Despite himself, a needle of envy pricked Aragon. He might be stronger, but he'd never been as muscular as his cousin. Roran grinned, hits as good as ever. Better, maybe. Thank you. You're welcome. It was the strangest thing. I actually felt as if I was going to crawl out of my hide. And it itched something terrible. I could barely keep from ripping. Get me some bread from your saddlebag, would you? I'm, I'm really hungry. We just had dinner. I need a bite to eat after using magic like that. Aragon sniffed and then pulled out his kerchief and wiped his nose. He sniffed again. What he had said was not quite true. It was a toll his spell had exacted on the wildlife that disturbed him. Not the magic itself. And he feared he might throw up unless he had something to settle his stomach. You're not ill, are you? said Roran. No. With the memory of the deaths he had caused still heavy in his mind, Aragon reached for the jar of mead by his side, hoping to fend off the tide of morbid thoughts. Something very large, heavy, and sharp struck his hand and pinned it against the ground. He winced and looked over to see the tip of one of Saphira's ivory claws digging into his flesh. Her thick eyelid went snick as it flashed across the great big glittering iris she fixed upon him. After a long moment, she lifted the claw as a person would a finger, and Aragon withdrew his hand. 
He gulped and gripped the, Hawth the Hawthorne staff once more, striving to ignore the mead and to concentrate upon what was immediate and tangible instead of wallowing in dismal introspection. Roran removed a ragged half of sourdough bread from his bags, then paused and, with a hint of a smile, said, Wouldn't you rather have some venison? I didn't finish all of mine. He held up the makeshift spit of spear juniper wood on which he were impaled three clumps of golden brown meat. To Aragon's sensitive nose, the odor that wafted toward him was thick and pungent and reminded him of nights he had spent in the spine and of long winter dinners where he, Roran, and Garrow, had gathered around their stove and enjoyed each other's company while a blizzard howled outside. His mouth watered. It's still warm, said Rorn, and waved the venison from the in front of Aragon. With an effort of will, Aragon shook his head. Just, just give me the bread. Are you sure? It's perfect, not too tough, not too tender, and cooked with a perfect amount of seasoning. It's so juicy when you take a bite, it's as if you swallowed a mouthful of Elaine's best stew. No, I can't. You know you'll like it. Roran, stop teasing me and hand over the bread. Ah, now see, you look better already. Maybe what you need isn't bread, but someone to get your hackles up, huh? Aaron Aragon glowered at him, then, faster than the eye could see, snatched the bread away from Roran. That seems to amuse Roran even more. As Aragon tore at the loaf, he said, I don't know how you can survive on nothing but fruit. And bread and vegetables. A man has to eat meat if he wants to keep his strength up. Don't you miss it? More than you can imagine. Then why do you insist on torturing yourself like this? Every creature in this world has to eat other living beings, even if they're only plants in order to survive. That is how we're made. Why attempt to defy the natural order of things? I said as much in Nell's Mira, observed Sephira, but he did not listen to me. Aragon shrugged. We already had this discussion. You do what you want. I won't tell you or anyone else how to live. However, I cannot in good conscience eat a beast whose thoughts and feelings I have shared. The tip of Sephira's tail twitched and her scales clinked against a torn dome of rock that protruded from the ground. Oh, he's hopeless. Lifting and extending her neck, Sephira nipped the venison, spit and all, from Roran's other hand. The wood cracked between her serrated teeth as she bit down, and then it and the meat vanished into the fiery depths of her belly. Mm, you did not exaggerate, she said, to, she said to Roran. What a sweet and succulent morsel, so soft, so salty, so delicious and delectable, it makes me want to wiggle with delight. You should cook for me more often, Roran Stronghammer. Only next time I think you should prepare several deer at once, otherwise I won't get a proper meal. Roran hesitated, as if I'm unable to decide whether her request was serious, and if so, how he could politely extricate himself from such an unlooked-for and rather onerous obligation. He cast a pleading glance at Aragon, who burst out laughing, both at Roran's expression and at his predicament. The rise and fall of Sephira's sonorous laugh joined with Aragon's and reverberated throughout the hollow. Her teeth gleamed matter red in the light from the embers. An hour after the three of them had retired, Aragon was lying on his back alongside Sephira, muffled in layers of blankets against the night cold. All was still and quiet. It seemed as if a magician had placed an enchantment upon the earth and that everything in the world was bound in an eternal sleep and would remain frozen and changing forevermore underneath the watchful gaze of the twinkling stars. Without moving, Aragon whispered in his mind, Sephira? Yes, little one. What if I'm right and he's in Hellgrind? I don't know what I should do then. Tell me, what should I do? I cannot tell you, little one. This is a decision you have to make by yourself. The ways of men are not the ways of dragons. I would tear off his head and feast on his body, but that would be wrong for you, I think. Will you stand by me, whatever I decide? Always, little one. Now, rest. All will be well. Comforted, Aragon gazed into the void between the stars and slowed his breathing as he drifted into the trance that had replaced sleep for him. He remained conscious of his surroundings, but against the backdrop of the white constellations, the figures of his waking dreams strode forth, 
and performed confused and shadowy plays as was their wont. Assault on Hellgrind. Daybreak was 15 minutes away when Aragon rolled upright. He snapped his fingers twice to waken Rorn and then scooped up his blankets and knotted them into a tight bundle. Pushing himself off the ground, Rorn did likewise with his own bedding. They looked at each other and shivered with excitement. If I die, said Rorn, you will see to Katrina, right? I shall. Tell her, tell her that I went into battle with joy in my heart and her name upon my lips. I shall. Aragon muttered a quick line in the ancient language. The drop in his strength that followed was almost imperceptible. There, that will filter the air in front of us and protect us from the paralyzing effects of the Razak's breath. From his bags, Aragon removed his shirt of mail and unwrapped the length of sackcloth he had stored it in. Blood from the fight in the burning plain still encrusted the once shining corset and the combination of dried gore, sweat, and neglect had allowed blotches of rust to creep across the rings. The mail was, however, free of scars. As Aragon had repaired them before, they departed for the Empire. Aragon donned the leather-backed shirt, wrinkling his nose at the stench of death and desperation that clung to it, then attached chased bracers to his forearms and greaves to his shins. Upon his head he placed a padded arming cap, a mail coif, and a plain steel helm. He had lost his own helm, the one he had worn in Farthen Dur, and that the dwarves had engraved with the crest of Durm Grimst and Jeetum, along with his shield during the aerial duel between Saphir and Thorn. On his hands went mailed gauntlets. Rorin outfitted himself in a similar manner. Although he augmented his armor with a wooden shield, a band of soft iron wrapped around the lip of the shield, the better to catch and hold an enemy's sword. No shield encumbered Aragorn's left arm. The Hawthorne staff required two hands to wield properly. Across his back, Aragorn slung the quiver given to him by Queen Islanzadi. In addition to twenty heavy oak arrows fletched with gray goose feathers, the quiver contained the bow with silver fittings that the Queen had sung out of a yew tree for him. The bow was already strung and ready for use. Saphira kneeled, the soil beneath her feet, let us be off. Leaving their bags and supplies hanging from the branch of a juniper tree, Aragorn and Rorn clambered on Saphira's back. They wasted no time saddling her. She had worn her tack through the night. The molded leather was warm, almost hot underneath Aragorn. He clutched the neck spike in front of him to steady himself during a, a sudden change in direction while Rorn hooked one thick arm around Aragorn's waist and brandished his hammer with the other. A piece of shale cracked under, under Saphira's weight as she settled into a low crouch, and in a single giddy bound, leaped up to the rim of the gulch, where she balanced for a moment before unfolding her massive wings. The thin membranes thrummed as Saphira raised them toward the sky. Vertical. They looked like two translucent blue sails. Not so tight, grunted Aragon. Sorry, said Rorin. He loosened his embrace. Further speech became impossible as Saphira jumped again. When she reached the pinnacle, she brought her wings down with a mighty whoosh, driving the three of them even higher. With each subsequent flap, they climbed closer to the flat, narrow clouds. As Saphira angled toward Hellgrind, Aragorn glanced to his left and discovered that he could see a broad swath of Leona Lake some miles distant. A thick layer of mist, gray and ghostly, in the pre-dawn glow emanated from the water as if witch-fire burned upon the surface of the liquid. Aragon tried, but even with his hawk-like vision, he could not make out the far shore, nor the southern reaches of the spine beyond, which he regretted. It had been too long since he had laid eyes upon the mountain range of his childhood. To the north stood Dras Leona, a huge, rambling mass that appeared in his blocky silhouette against the wall of mist that edged its western flank. The one building Aragorn could identify was the cathedral where the Razak had attacked him. Its flanged spire loomed above the rest of the city like a barbed spearhead. And somewhere in the landscape that crushed down below them, Aragorn knew where the remnants of the campsite where the Razak had mortally wounded Brom. He allowed all his anger and grief over the events of that day, as well as Garrow's murder and the destruction of their farm to surge forth and give him the courage, nay, the desire to face the Razak in combat. Aragon, 
sense of fear today. We need not guard our minds and keep our thoughts secret from one another, do we? Well, not unless another magician should appear. A fan of golden light flared into existence at the top of the sun crested the horizon. In an instant, the full spectrum of color is enlivened the previously drab world. The mist glowed white. The water became a rich blue. The daubed mud wall that encircled the center of Drasuna revealed its dingy yellow sides. The trees cloaked themselves in every shade of green, and the soil blushed red and orange. Hellgrind, however, remained as it always was, dark. The mountain of stone rapidly grew larger as they approached, even from the air. It was intimidating. Driving toward the base of Helgrun, Saphir tilted so far to her left, Aragorn and Roran would have fallen if they had not already strapped their legs to the saddle. Then she whipped around the apron of screen over the altar where the priest of Helgrind observed their ceremonies. The lip of Aragorn's helm caught the wind from her passage and produced a howl that almost deafened him. Well... Shouted Roran, he could not see in front of them. The slaves are gone! A great weight seemed to press Aragorn into his seat as Saphira pulled out of her dive and spiraled up around Helgrind, searching for an entrance to the Razak's hideout. Not even a hole big enough for a wood rat, she declared. She slowed and hung in place for before the ridge that connected the third lowest of the four peaks to the prominence above. The jagged but buttress magnified the boom produced by each stroke of her wings until it was loud as a thunderclap. Aragorn's eyes watered as, in the air, as the air pulsed around and against his skin. A web of white veins adorned the backside of the crags and pillars where hoarfrost had collected in the cracks that furrowed the rock. Nothing else disturbed the gloom of Helgrind's inky, wind-swept ramparts. No trees grew among the slanting stones, nor shrubs, grass or lichen. Nor did eagles dare nest upon the tower's broken ledges. True to its name, Helgrind was a place of death and stood cloaked in the razor-sharp sawtooth folds of its scarps and clefts like a bony specter risen to the haunt of the earth. Casting his mind outward, Aragorn confirmed the presence of the two people whom he had discovered imprisoned within Helgrind the previous day. But he felt nothing of the slaves, and to his concern, he still could not locate the Razak or the Letherblaka. If they aren't here, then where? he wondered. Searching again, he noticed something that had eluded him before. A single flower. A gentian blooming not fifty feet in front of him, where, by all rights, there ought to be a solid rock. How does it get enough light to live? Sephira answered his question by perching on a crumbling spur several feet to the right. As she did, she lost her balance for a moment and flared her wings to steady herself. Instead of brushing into the bulk of Helgrind, the tip of her right wing dipped into the rock and then back out again. Sephira, did you see that? I, I, I did. Leaning forward, Sephira pushed the tip of her snout toward a sheer rock, paused an inch or two away, as if waiting for a strap to, to, to spring to them, then continued her advance. Scale by scale, Saphira slid into Helgrind until it was all that was visible of her to Aragorn was her neck, torso, and wings. With a surge of her mighty thews, she abandoned the spur and flung the rest of her body after her head. It required every bit of Aragorn's self-control to not cover his face in a desperate bid to protect himself as the crag rushed toward him. An instant later, he found himself looking at a broad, bolted cave suffused with the warm glow of morning. Saphira's scales reflected the light, casting thousands of shifting blue flecks across the rock, twisting around. Aragorn saw no wall behind them, only in the mouth of the cave and a sweeping view of the landscape beyond. Aragorn grimaced. It had never occurred to him that Galbatorx might have hidden the Razak's lair with magic. The idiot! I have to do better, he thought. Underestimating the king was a sure way to get them all killed. Roran swore and said, Warn me before you do something like that again, please. Hunching forward, Aragorn began to unbuckle his legs from the saddle as he studied their surroundings, alert for danger. To the opening of the cave was an irregular oval, perhaps 50 feet high and 60 feet wide. 
From there, the chamber expanded to twice that size before ending a good bow shot away in a pile of thick stone slabs that leaned against each other in a confusing wrangle of uncertain angles. A mat of scratches defaced the floor, evidence of the many times the leather blocka had taken off from and landed on and walked about its surface. Like mysterious keyholes, five low tunnels pierced the side of the cave, as did a lancet passageway large enough to accommodate Sephira. Aragon examined the tunnels carefully, but they were pitch black and appeared vacant, a fact he confirmed with quick thrusts of his mind. Strange, disjointed murmurs echoed from within Helgrind's innards, suggesting unknown things scurrying about in the dark and endlessly dripping water. Adding to the chorus was the steady rise and fall of Sephira's breathing, which was overloud in the confines of the bare chamber. The most distinctive features of the cavern, however, was the mixture of odors that pervaded it. The smell of cold stone dominated by... By, but underneath Aragon discerned whiffs of damp and mold and something far worse. The sickly sweet fet fetter of rotting meat. Undoing the last few straps, Aragon swung his right leg over Sephira's spine, so he was sitting si side saddle and prepared to jump off her back. Roran did the same on the opposite side. Before he released his hold, Aragon heard amid the many rustlings that teased his ear a score of simultaneous clicks, as if someone had stuck the rock with a collection of hammers. The sound repeated itself a second later. He looked in the direction of the noise, as did Sephira. A huge, twisted shape hurtled out of the lancet passageway, eyes black, bulging, rimless, a beak seven feet long, bat-like wings, the torso naked, hairless, rippling with muscle, claws like iron spikes. Sephira lurched as she tried to evade the leather block, but to no avail, the creature crashed into her right side with what felt like to Aragon the strength and fury of an avalanche. What exactly happened next, he knew not, for the impact sent him tumbling through space without so much as a half-formed thought in his jumbled brain. His blind flight ended as abruptly as it began when something hard and flat rammed against the back of him, and he dropped to the floor, banging his head. The last collision drove the remaining air clean out of Aragon's lungs. Stunned, they lay curled on his side, gasping and struggling to regain a semblance of control over his unresponsive limbs. Aragon! cried Sephira. The concern in her voice fueled Aragorn's efforts as nothing else could. As life returned to his arms and legs, he reached out and grasped his staff from where it had fallen beside him. He planted the spike mounted on the staff lower and end into a nearby crack and pulled himself up the hawthorn rod and onto his feet. He swayed. A swarm of crimson sparks danced before him. The situation was so confu confusing, he hardly knew where to look. Sephira and the leather blocker rolled across the cave, kicking and clawing and snapping at each other with enough force to gouge the rock beneath them. The clamor of their fight must have been imaginably loud, but to Aragon they grappled in silence. His ears did not work. Still, he felt the vibrations through the soles of his feet as the colossal beasts thrashed from side to side, threatening to crush anyone who came near. A torrent of blue fire erupted from between Sephira's jaws and bathed the left side of the leather block's head in a ravening inferno, hot enough to melt steel. The flames curved around the leather block without harming it. Undeterred, the monster pecked at Sephira's neck, forcing her to stop and defend herself. Fast as an arrow loosed from a bow, the second leather block darted out of the lancet passageway, pouncing upon Sephira's flank and opening its narrow beak uttered a horrible, withering shriek that made Aragon's scalp prickle and a cold lump of dread form in his gut. He snarled in discomfort. That he could definitely hear. The smell now, with both leather block, of, leather block of present, resembled the sort of overpowering stench one would get from tossing a half dozen pounds of rancid meat into a barrel of sewage and allowing the mixture to ferment for a week in summer. Aragon clamped his mouth shut as his gorge rose and turned his attention elsewhere to keep him from retching. A few paces away, Roran lay crumpled against the side of the cave where he too had landed. Even as Aragorn watched, his cousin lifted an arm and pushed himself onto all fours, and then to his feet his eyes were glazed, and he tottered as if drunk. 
Behind Rorn, the two Rosic emerged from a nearby tunnel. They wielded long, pale blades of an ancient design in their malformed hands. Unlike their parents, the Rosic were roughly the same size and in shape as humans. An ebony exoskeleton encased them from top to bottom, although little of it showed, for even in Helgrind, the Rosic wore dark robes and cloaks. They advanced with startling swiftness, their movements sharp and jerky like those of an insect. And yet, Aragorn still could not sense them, or Leather Blocka. Are they an illusion too, he wondered? But no, that was nonsense. The flesh Sephira tore at with her talons was real enough. Another explanation occurred to him. Perhaps it was impossible to detect their presence. Perhaps the Rosic could conceal themselves from the minds of humans, their prey, just as spiders conceal themselves from flies. If so, then Aragorn finally understood why the Rosic had been so successful hunting magicians and riders for Galvatorix when they themselves could not use magic. Blast! Aragorn would have indulged in more colorful O's, but it was time for action, not cursing their bad luck. Brom had claimed the Rosic were no match for him in broad daylight, and while that might have been true, given that Brom had decades to invent spells to use against the Rosic, Aragorn knew that without the advantage of surprise, he, Saphir, and Rorn would be hard-pressed to escape with their lives, much less rescue, rescue Katrina. Raising his right hand above his head, Aragorn cried, Brissinger! and threw a roaring fireball toward the Rozak. They dodged, and the fireball splashed against the rock floor, guttered for a moment, and then winked out of existence. The spell was silly and childish and could cause no conceivable damage if Galvatorx protected the Rozak like, le like the Leatherbaka. But still, Aragorn found the attack immensely satisfying. It, was all it also distracted the Rozak long enough for Aragorn to dash over to Roran and press his back against his cousins. Hold him off for just a minute, he shouted. Hoping Rorn could hear, whether he did not, did or did not, Rorn grasped Aragorn's meaning, for he covered himself with his shield and lifted his hammer in pre preparation for the fight. The amount of force contained within each of the Leatherpockets' terrible lows had already depleted the wards against physical danger that Aragorn had placed around Saphira. Without them, the Leatherblock had inflicted several rows of scratches, long but shallow, along her thighs and managed to stab her three times with their beaks. Those wounds were short but deep and caused a great deal of pain. In return, Saphira had laid open the ribs of one of the, le one of the Leather Blocka and had bitten off the l at least three feet of the other's tail. The Leather Blocka's blood, to Aragorn's astonishment, was a metallic blue-green, not unlike the ver verdigris that forms on aged copper. At, the m at that moment, the Leather Blocka had withdrawn from Saphira and were circling her, lunging now, then in, in order to keep her at bay while they waited for her to tire, or until they could kill her with a stab from one of their beaks. Saphira was better suited than the Leather Blocker to combat, to combat by virtue of her scales, which were harder and tougher than the Leather Blocker's gray hide, and her teeth, which were far more lethal in close quarters than the Leather Blocker's beaks. But despite all of that, she had difficulty fending off both creatures at once, especially since the ceiling prevented her from leaping and flying about and otherwise outmaneuvering her foes. Aragorn feared that if she prevailed, the Leather Blocker would maim her before she slew them. Taking a quick breath, Aragorn cast a single spell that contained every one of the twelve techniques of killing that Ormus had taught him. He was careful to phrase the incantation as a series of processes so that if Galvatorx's wards foiled him, he could sever the flow of magic. Otherwise, the spell might consume his strength until he died. It was well he took the precaution. Upon release of the spell, Aragorn quickly became aware that the magic was having no effect upon the leather blocker, and he abandoned the assault and had no, not expected to succeed with the traditional death words, but he had to try. On the slight chance, Galvatorx might have been careless or ignorant when he had placed wards upon the Leather Blocka and their spawn. Behind him, Rorn shouted, Yah! An instant later, a sword thudded against the shield, followed by the tinkle of rippling mail and the bell-like peal of a second sword bouncing off Rorn's helm. Aragorn realized that his hearing must be improving. The Rozak struck again and again, but each time the weapons glanced off Rorn's armor or missed his face and limbs by a hair's breadth. No matter how fast they swung their blades, Rorn was too slow to retaliate, but neither could the Rozak harm him. They hissed with frustration and spewed a continuous stream of invectives, which seemed all the more foul because of how the creature's hard, clacking jaws mangled the language. Aragorn smiled. The cocoon of charms he had spun around Rorn had done its job, he hoped that the invisible net of energy could, would hold 
until he could find a way to halt the leather blocker. Everything shivered and went gray around Aragorn as the two leather blockers shrieked in unison. For a moment, his resolve completely deserted him, leaving him unable to move. Then he rallied and shook himself as a dog might, casting off their fell influence. The sound remain, reminded him of nothing so much as a pair of children screaming in pain. Then Aragorn began to chant as fast as he could without mispronouncing the, the ancient language. Each sentence he uttered, and they were legion, contained the potential to deliver instant death, and each death was unique among its fellows. As he recited its improvised soliloquy, Saphira received another cut upon her left flank. In return, she broke the wings of her assailant, slashing the thin flight membrane into ribbons with her claws. A number of heavy impacts transmitted themselves from Roran's back to Aragon's as the Rosic hacked and stabbed in lightning-quick frenzy. The largest of the two Rosic began to edge around Roran in order to attack Aragon more directly. And then, amid the din of steel against steel and steel against wood, the claws against stone, there came the scrape of a sword sliding through mail, followed by a wet crunch. Roran yelled, and Aragon felt blood splash across the calf of his right leg. Out of the corner of his eye, Aragorn watched as the humpbacked figure leaped toward him, extending its leaf blade sword as to impale him. Thus, the world seemed to contract around the thin, narrow point. The tip glittered like a shard of crystal, each scratch a thread of quicksilver in the bright light of dawn. He only had time for one more spell before he had to devote himself to stopping the Razak from inserting the sword between his liver and kidneys. In desperation, he gave up trying to directly harm the leather block and instead cried, God's the letter! It was a crude spell, constructed in haste and poorly worded, yet it worked. The bulbous eyes of the leather blocker with the broken wing began a matched set of mirrors, each a perfect hemisphere. As Aragorn's magic reflected the light that otherwise would have entered the leather blocker's pupils, blind, the creature stumbled and flailed at the air in vain attempt to hit Sephira. Aragorn spun the hawthorn staff in his hands and knocked aside the Rosic sword when it was less than an inch from his ribs. The Rosic landed in front of him and jutted out of its neck. Aragorn recoiled as a short, thick beak appeared from within the depths of, his of its hood. The chitinous appendage snapped just short of his right eye. In a rather detached way, Aragorn noticed that the Rosic tongued was barbed in a purple and writhed like a headless snake. Bringing his hands together at the center of the staff, Aragorn drove his arms forward, striking the Rosic across its hollow chest and throwing the monster back several yards. It fell upon it on its hands and knees. Aragorn pivoted around Rorn, whose left side was slick with blood, and parried the sword of the other Rosic. He fainted, beat the Rosic's blade, and then when the Rosic stabbed at his throat, whirled the other half of the staff across his body and deflected the thrust. Without pausing, Aragorn lunged forward and planted the wooden end of the staff in the Rosak's abdomen. If Aragorn had been wielding Zarok, he would have killed the Rosak then and there. As it was, something cracked inside the Rosak, and the creature went rolling across the cave for a dozen or more paces. It immediately popped up again, leaving a smear of blue gore on the uneven rock. I need a sword, thought Aragorn. He widened his stance as the, the two Rosak converged upon him. He had no choice but to hold his ground and face their combined onslaught, for he was all that he could stand between those hook-clawed carrion crows and Rorin. He began to mouth the same spell that had proved itself against the leather block, but the Rosic executed high and low slashes before he could utter even a syllable. The swords rebounded off the hawthorn with a dull bonk that did not dent or otherwise mar the enchanted wood. Left, right, up, and down, Aragorn did not think he acted and reacted as he exchanged a flurry of blows with the Razak. The staff was ideal for fighting multiple opponents, as he could strike and block with both ends, and often simultaneously. The ability served him well now. He panted, each breath short and quick, sweat dripped from his brow and gathered at the corners of his eyes, and a layer greased his back and the underside of his arms. The red haze of battle dimmed his vision and throbbed in response to the convulsions of his heart. He never felt so alive or afraid as he did when he was fighting. Aragorn's own words were scant. Since he had lavished the bulk of his attention on Saphira and Rorn, Aragorn's magical defenses soon failed, and the smaller Rosic wounded him on the side of his left knee. The injury was not life-threatening, but it was still serious, for his leg would no longer support his full weight. 
Gripping the spike at the bottom, Aragon swung the staff like a club and bashed one Razak upside the head. The Razak collapsed, but whether it was dead or only unconscious, Aragon could not tell. Advancing upon the remaining Razak, he battered the creature's arms and shoulders and, with a sudden twist, knocked the sword out of his hand. Before Aragon could, could finish off the Razak, the blinded, broken-winged leather block flew the width of the cave and slammed against the far wall, knocking loose a shower of stone flakes from the ceiling. The sight and sound were so colossal they caused Aragon, Rorn, and the Razak to flinch in turn, simply out of instinct. Jumping after the crippled leather block, which she had just kicked, Saphira sank her teeth into the back of the creature's sinewy neck. The leather block had thrashed in one final effort to free itself, and then Saphira whipped her head from side to side and broke its spine. Rising from her bloody kill, Saphira filled the cave with a savage roar of victory. The remaining leather block did not hesitate. Tackling Saphira, it dug its claws underneath the edges of her scales and pulled her into an uncontrollable tumble. Together, they, lo they rolled the lip of the cave, teared for half a second, and then dropped out of sight, battling the whole way. It was a very clever tactic, for it carried the leather block out of the range of Aragon's senses, and that which he could not sense, he could difficulty, he had a difficulty casting a spell against. Safira! cried Aragon. Tend to yourself, this one won't escape me. With a start, Aragon whirled around just in time to see the two Razak vanish into the depths of the nearest tunnel, the smaller supporting the larger. Closing his eyes, Aragon located the minds of the prisoners in Helgrin, muttered a burst of ancient language, and then said to Rorn, I sealed off Katrina's cell so the Razak can't use her as a hostage. Only you and I can open the door now. G good, said Rorn through clenched teeth. C can you do something about this? He jerked his chin toward the spot he had clamped his right hand over. Blood well between his fingers. Aragon probed the wound. As soon as he touched it, Rorn flinched and recoiled. You're lucky, said Aragon. The sword hit a rib. Placing one hand on the injury and the other on the twelve diamonds concealed inside the belt of Bell the Wise, strapped around his waist, Aragon drew upon the power and stored within the gems and said, Ways heal. A ripple traversed Roran's side as the magic knit his skin and muscle back together again. Then Aragon healed his own wound, the gash on his left knee. Finished, he straightened and glanced in the direction of Saphira had gone. His connection with her was fading as she chased the leather block toward Leona Lake. He yearned to help her, but he knew that for the long for the time being, she would have to fend for herself. Hurry! said Rorn. They're getting away! Uh, right! Hefting his staff, Aragon approached the unlit tunnel and flicked his gaze from one stone protrusion to another, expecting the rods to spring out from behind one of them. He moved slowly in order that his footsteps would not echo in the winding shaft. When he opened to a touch a rock to steady himself, he found it coated in slime. After a score of yards, several folds and twists in the passageway hid the, the main cavern and plunged them into a gloom so profound even Aragon found it impossible to see. Maybe you're different, but I can't fight in the dark, whispered Roran. If I make a light, the Razak won't come near us, not when I know a spell that works on them. They'll just hide until we leave. We have to kill them while we have a chance. What am I supposed to do? I'm more likely to run into a wall and break my nose than I am to find those two beetles. They could sneak around behind us and stab us in the back. Shh, hold on to my belt. Follow me and be ready to duck. Aragon could not see, but he could still hear, smell, touch, and taste. And those faculties were sensitive enough to that he had a fair idea of what lay nearby. The greatest danger was that the Razak would attack from a distance, perhaps with a bow, but he trusted that his reflexes were sharp enough to save Rorn and himself from, from the oncoming missile. A current of air tickled Aragon's skin, then paused and reversed itself as pressure from the outside waxed and waned. The cycle repeated itself in an inconsistent intervals, creating invisible eddies that brushed against him like fountains of roiling water. His breathing and Rorin's was loud and ragged compared with the odd assortment of sounds that propagated throughout the tunnels. Above the gusts of their respiration, Aragorn caught the tink, clink, clatter of a stone falling somewhere in the tangle of branching tubes, and the steady doink, doink, doink of condensed droplets striking the drum-like surface of a subterranean pool. He also heard the grind of pea-sized gravel crushed underneath the soles of his boots. A long, eerie moan wavered somewhere far ahead of him. Of smells, none were new. Sweat, blood, damp, and mold. But step by step, Aragorn led the way as they burrowed further into the bowels of Helgrind. 
the tunnel slanted downward and often split or turned so that Aragon would have soon been lost if he had not been able to use Katrina's mind as a reference point. The various Navi holes were low and cramped. Once, when Aragon bumped his head against the ceiling, a sudden flare of claustrophobia unnerved him. I'm back, Saphir announced just as, Ar just as Aragon put his foot on a rugged step hewn out of the rock below him. He paused. She had escaped additional injury, which relieved him. And the leather blocka? Floating belly up and lowly on a lake. I'm afraid that some fishermen saw our battle. They were rowing towards Drassigan when I saw them last. Well, it can't be helped, then. See where you can find the tunnel the leather blocka came out of, and keep an eye out for the Razak. They may try to slip past us and escape Hellgrind through the entrance we used. They probably have a bolt hole or at ground level. Probably. I, I don't think they'll, ru they'll, they'll run quite yet, though. After what seemed like an hour trapped in the darkness, though Aragon knew it could not have been more than ten or fifteen minutes, and after descending more than a hundred feet through Hellgrind, Aragon stopped in a level patch of stone, transmitting his thoughts to Rorin. He said, Katrina's cell is about fifty feet in front of us, off to the right. We can't risk letting her out until the Razak are dead or gone. What if they won't reveal themselves until we do let her out? For some reason, I can't sense them. They could hide from me until doomsday in here, so do we wait for who knows how long, or do we freak at Trina while we still have the chance? I can place some wards around her that would protect her from most attacks. Roran was quiet for a second. <sighs> Let's free her then. They began to move forward, again feeling their way along the squat corridor with its rough, unfinished floor. Aragorn had to devote most of his attention to his footing in order to maintain his balance. As a result, he almost missed the swish of cloth sliding over cloth and then the faint twang that emanated from his right. He recoiled against the wall, shoving Roran back at the same time something augured past his face, carving a groove of flesh from his right cheek. Then the thin trench burned as if cauterized. Kvyakya! shouted Aragon. Red light bright as the midday sun flared into existence. It had no source and thus illuminated every surface evenly and without shadows giving those a curious, flat appearance. The sudden blaze dazzled Aragorn, but did more that than that to the lone Razak in front of him. The creature actually dropped the bow, covered its hooded face, and screamed high and shrill. A similar screech told Aragorn that the second Razak was behind them. Roran! Aragorn pivoted just in time to see Roran charge the other Razak hammer held high. The distorted monster stumbled backward, but was too slow. The hammer fell. For my father! shouted Roran. He struck again, For our home! The Razak was already dead, but Roran lifted the hammer once more. For Carvajal! His final blow shattered the Razak's carapace like the grind of a dry gourd. In the merciless ruby glare, the spreading pool of blood appeared purple. Spinning his staff in a circle to knock aside the arrow or sword that he was convinced was driving towards him, Aragon turned to confront the remaining Razak. The tunnel before him was empty. He swore. Aragon strode over to the twisted figure on the floor. His, he swung the staff over his head and brought it down across the chest of the dead Razak with a resounding thud. I've waited a long time to do that, said Aragon. As have I. He and Roran looked at each other. Ah! cried Aragon and clutched his cheek as the pain testified. It's, bub it's bubbling, exclaimed Roran. Do something! The Razak must have coated the, the arrowhead with seether oil, thought Aragon. Remembering his training, he cleansed the wound and surrounded the tissue with an incantation and then repaired the damage to his face. He opened and closed his mouth several times to make sure that the muscles were working properly. With a grim smile, he said, Imagine the state we would have been in without magic. Yeah, well, without magic, we wouldn't have Galbatorx to worry about, huh? Talk later said Saphira. As soon as those fishermen reach Drasliana, the king may hear of our doings from one of his pet spellcasters in the city, and we do not want Galvatorx scrying Hellgrind while we're still here. The, oh, yeah, yeah, said Aragon, Extinguishing the omnipresent red glow, he said, Brissingerauder, and created a red wear light that from the previous night, except that this one remained anchored six inches from the ceiling instead of accompanying Aragon wherever he went. Now that he had an opportunity to examine the tunnel in some detail, Aragorn saw that the stone hallway was dotted with twenty or so iron-bound doors, some on either side. He pointed and said, Ninth down the right. You get, you go get her. I'll check the other cells. The Rossick might have left something interesting in them. Roran nodded, crouching. He searched the corpse at their feet, but found no keys. He shrugged. 
I'll do it the hard way, then. He sprinted to the proper door and abandoned his shield and set to work in the hinges with his hammer. Each blow created a frightful crash. Aragon did not offer to help. His cousin would not want or appreciate assistance now. And besides, there was something else Aragon had to do. He went to the first cell, whispered three words, and after the lock snapped open, pushed aside the door. All that the small room contained was a black chain and a pile of rotting bones. Those sad remains are no more than he had expected. He already knew where the object of his search lay, but he maintained the shroud of ignorance to avoid kindling Rorin's suspicion. Two more doors opened and closed beneath the touch of Aragorn's fingers. Then, at the fourth cell, the door swung back to emit a shifting radiance of the weir light, revealing the very man Aragorn had hoped he would not find. It was Sloane. And with that, my friends, we'll end this part of Brissinger Part 2. Again, thank you for those of you that are in Discord with me this evening. For those of you that are watching this after the fact, if you want to join us for these readings live, you can do so in the Shrubbery Discord, which you can find on my About page. We start these at 6 p.m. Pacific, 7 Mountain, Saturday, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern on Mondays. And I stream Sunday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 Mountain, Standard, 7 Central, and 8 Eastern. And I uh, hope that you have a beautiful day. And if not, I hope that this at least made your day a little bit easier and better. Until next time, my friends. Take care of yourselves. Tell someone that you love them, and remember that you are worthy of the same love that you want to see for others. Appreciate you all the bits. Take care.